and thank you all for being here. I'm indebted to Pavitra for more ways than she knows. Well, I've always admired her words, words and world that continue to teach me in all sorts of ways. And it's also a pleasure, it's a real pleasure, returning to my own alma mater, this Vancouver campus, where also none other than my great teacher and comrade, Professor Carol Siegel teaches. I'm very honored that Professor Carol Siegel is here. And when she is here and in front of me, then I have a little bit of trepidation, I must confess. <laughs> so within 25 minutes, the time that I have been given, what I can do is to share with you only a tiny segment of my ongoing work, which will be a book in the Insurrection book series of Columbia University Press next year. And this ongoing work, broadly speaking, is about the politics of what is called war literature and the politics of what is called interdisciplinarity that I examine using what the Kenyan African novelist, theorist, activist, Nogugu Yathyongo calls a global lectical optic. Now, I have an epigraph to my talk, one which is taken from Nogugi's most recent book, 2012, published in 2012, a groundbreaking theoretical undertaking called Global Lectics itself, and I quote, Global Lectics combines the global and the dialectical. The global is that which humans in spaceships or on the international space stations see the dialectical is the internal dynamics they do not see. Globalectics embraces wholeness, interconnectedness, equality of potentiality of parts, tension, and motion. Globalectics is a way of thinking and relating to the world, particularly in the era of globalism or globalization. And global ethics becomes the way of reading world literature. It also becomes a tool for clarifying interactive connections of social phenomena and their mutual impact in the local and global space, a means of illuminating the external and the internal, the local and global dynamics of social being. This may also mean the act of reading becoming also a process of self-examination, unquote. So that was Nogubi Thiongo. And uh, so as someone who writes poetry in two languages, Bengali and English, more in Bengali than in English, and as someone who translates from several non-Western languages, particularly including Bengali itself, and as someone interested in exploding conventional generic borders and boundaries, while also interested in enacting a dialectic between poetics, politics, and praxis in a world of unequal production relations and unequal power relations, and as someone interested in doing theory by way of telling stories, even in poetry, and in telling stories by way of doing theory, I think I would do well to share with you my own poems originally written in Bengali and later translated into English. I have done that in an attempt to formulate and mobilize certain questions about what has come to be known as interdisciplinarity. As Jan Schmidt also points out, interdisciplinarity is one of the popular buzzwords in scientific and public discourse today. So, my poem now is called 10,000 Atypical Haiku Dedicated to Caliban. But I'll read only 10 though. And I'll talk about Caliban later, Caliban in the context of Shakespeare's play. But let me just tell you this, Caliban is a character that appears in Shakespeare's play called The Tempest. Caliban there is a slave and his master is Prospero. And uh, in his mood and mode of resistance, Caliban at one point in the play responds to his master Prospero by saying, I have learned the language from you, but my profit on it is I know how to curse. That is, Caliban's language has been taken away by Prospero. 
prosperous own language, that is English, has been imposed on Caliban. Caliban has learned the language so damn well that in that very language he cannot tell Prospero, you bastard. <laughs> so, so that's so that's the background. And here, here, here are my my haiku, haikus to put haiku in the plural. Number one, Caliban, run, 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 run. I know it's no fun. Two, Caliban, be in. Between being and seeming, Caliban is drinking. Number three, Caliban is stinking, while Prospero is puking, and who says a come in? Four, a freshy white guy. Caliban's a dream and boredom he wants to buy. Five, you care and you care, but I don't. Rain or sunshine, history a snare. Six, layer upon layer, you make the same old damn point on my foot, on my hair. Seven, progress is history's dirty joke or its bad rhyme. Caliban fakes his knees. Eight, Caliban comes back. In boredom under the moon, someone talks of lack. Nine, be quiet, Caliban. Don't dirty my Miranda. Caliban takes a U-turn. And last, ten, the night's dark. It's the ink. Caliban bees on the brink. His pea stains stick and stink. So that was my Caliban haiku. But who is the stinking Caliban? A Caliban who's always on the move, but continuously and even strenuously struggling. A Caliban who acutely realizes that he is not free, but that the borders and boundaries of his own territory are policed. A Caliban who, however, thinks of insurrection and dreams of emancipation. In fact, more than 500 years ago, during the period of what might be called mercantile capitalism, none other than the English playwright William Shakespeare, as I already told you, created this character, Caliban, and he appears in this play, The Tempest. And in this play, Caliban is, of course, a slave, as I already pointed out, but a colonized native, one whose land, labor, language, and body before crucial material sites of struggles, the sites of both oppression and opposition for the global oppressed, as I've argued elsewhere, are all occupied and even owned by his master, Prospero. In other words, the relationship between Prospero and Caliban, to put it very simply, is one between the master and slave, and his slave between the colonizer and the colonized. And I think I would do well to provide you with a diagram here Actually, with these four categories, these four categories are extremely crucial in terms of, for me, in terms of reading certain anti-colonial texts, literary texts, and cultural forms, particularly the ones which were, are produced in the wake of what is called decolonization. So these four categories, land, labor, language, and the body. And they're concentric circles here, as you can see, meaning that they're all profoundly, variously, if not always, unproblematically interconnected. And these four categories, I argue, can be used in, if, we, if I argue, if, if, if we can bring together these four categories in their dynamic relationships, we can better understand the histories of capitalism and colonialism. And you will see that a whole host of anti-colonial novelists, say from the Latin American Gabriel Garcia Marquez to the African novelist Nagobiya Thiongo to the Asian Bengali novelist, fiction writer, after his own Elias, can be read. And they have been concerned with these four sites, these four spaces of struggles for the oppressed, to put it roughly at this point. But Caliban, as a colonized subject, as Shakespeare portrays him, is by no means tamed by the discipline of Prospero, discipline in the Foucauldian sense, 
disciplined within quotation marks that Michel Foucault theorizes in his seminal work instructively called Discipline and Punish, simultaneously as a set of governing rules and epistemic codes, as well as an area of study, a discursive body, and even a power slash knowledge network constituted by those rules and codes. In fact, in Shakespeare's play, The Tempest, as I've already said in his resistance, Calvin explodes, explodes in the face of what might be called prosperous disciplinary colonialism. Calvin says, let me repeat these lines, my favorite, all-time favorite lines. You have taught me language, but my profit on it is I know how to curse, unquote. Indeed, Shakespeare has given, as the Caribbean poet Derek Walcott rightly points out, I quote, some of the most beautiful poetic lines to Caliban, unquote. While what has come to be known as post-colonial theory today takes those lines of Caliban I have cited as the locus classicus of the colonized, talking back and even striking back. In fact, a particular reading of Shakespeare's Caliban has enabled some anti-colonial critics to come up with the conceptual apparatus of talking back and striking back an apparatus that variously aids what might be called an anti-colonial hermeneutic. Hermeneutic, by the way, it means it has to do with the theory of reading and interpretation, you know, so hermeneutic. But Caliban is more than his moments of talking back or even striking back, as we would see. <clears throat> In fact, a whole host of creative writers and theorists from Asia, Africa, and Latin America have variously refashioned reframed, remobilized, and even further radicalized Shakespeare's Caliban, while also metaphorizing or tropologizing him on various registers. One can think of an entire constellation of figures constituted by, for instance, the Haitian poet Anthony Phelps, the Sudanese Ugandan poet Taban Lolion, the Caribbean brother Barbadian novelist and poet George Lamming, the Cuban poet and critic Roberto Fernandez Retamar, another Caribbean, rather Barbadian poet Edward Brathwaite, the Jewish Tunisian writer and theorist Albert Memmi, the Sierra Leonean poet and critic Lemuel Johnson, the Ghanaian poet theorist activist Rafael Ernest Grail Armatoe, another Ghanaian poet Kofi Awanur, and of course, remarkably indeed, the great Caribbean poet, theorist activist, also known as Franz Fanon's own theoretical guru, Aimé Césaire. <clears throat> Here, I intend to draw on Aimé Césaire's rereading and even a rewriting of Shakespeare's Caliban to be able to think about interdisciplinarity itself as an over-determined site of struggle. When I use the word over-determined, I think I need to explain this. This term comes from or has been theorized by the French structuralist Marxist uh, Althusser, but before Althusser the term was already used in a different context in some ways by Karl Marx himself, particularly in his work called the Grundrisse. Now what does this overdetermination mean? To put it simply, when a given phenomenon, a given experience, a given event is determined by a number of conflictual and converging factors, you have overdetermination. Think of a truck that is overloaded. So think of something like a phenomenon that is overdetermined, overloaded. So it's determined by a number of factors in that sense, overdetermined. So, you know, uh, interdisciplinarity itself is an overdetermined site of struggle. To begin with, yes, Cesare himself identifies with Caliban. In fact, the very figure of Caliban, who in addition to providing metaphorical energy, enables Cesare to forge connections between the autobiographical the aesthetic, the historical, and the political, while challenging and unsettling the disciplinary linearism of Western historiography, for instance. It's not for nothing that a whole host of poet theorists from Chagavara's tri-continent, such as Africa, Asia, and Latin America, have already contended that certain poems and poetic plays, if not all, can be exemplary anti-disciplinary in a given historic hegemonic block, to use Antonio Gramsci's famous term, while poetry even can help us think about and through 
what interdisciplinarity is and what it can do in so far as poetry tends to exemplify and replicate the interactive and integrating and synthesizing activities of an interdisciplinarian herself. While the entire domain of human knowledge constitutes the poet's interests. And Caliban himself, I argue, is a poet who does not merely transgress and unsettle, for instance, Western disciplinary borders and boundaries, but being a poet and a rebellious slave himself, Caliban even forges out of existential necessity what I wish to call an insurrectionary interdisciplinarity, an issue I will take up later at some length if time permits. Meanwhile, parenthetically and quickly, I should point out here that poetry has hardly been used in theorizing interdisciplinarity in the West. Just mark that very absence, for instance, in the relatively recent and impressively voluminous work called The Oxford Handbook of Interdisciplinarity, edited by Robert Schrodman et al., whose works I otherwise admire, hence my emphasis on poetry. In fact, I use Caliban to bring up the questions of resistance poetry, and thus even the question of anti-colonial poetics. And I bring up these questions of resistance poetry and anti-colonial poetics to be able to think about what I also wish to call an anti-colonial interdisciplinarity itself as a performance, even as a form of praxis, one that cannot be, of course, politically and ideologically neutral and innocent. And if we integrate and synthesize some of the best insights from those creative readings of Caliban, foregrounded and mobilized by those third world, within quotation marks, third world writers and theorists, I quickly mentioned earlier, if you recall, we begin to see that Caliban, as a rebellious slave and as a powerful poet, turns out to be not only anti-disciplinary, but an interdisciplinarian in his own right one who relentlessly integrates and synthesizes the discourses of poetry and magic and politics and even botany and life sciences and geology and astronomy to accentuate the need for emancipation from all forms of slavery while making it clear that politics, politics and praxis are all variously interconnected. Mark them. The following exchange, I'm going to share with you an exchange from a play, exchange between Prospero and Caliban in Amy Cesar's own poetry-charged play called Our Tempest, written in response to Shakespeare's play The Tempest. In fact, Cesar rewrites Shakespeare. Why? According to Cesar, Shakespeare's Caliban impressively resists colonial discipline and domination all right. But according to Cesare again, Shakespeare's Caliban is not revolutionary enough to demand his emancipation, and for that matter, what the African theorist activist Amilcar Cabral calls, I quote, the total, the total emancipation of humanity, unquote. In so far as Shakespeare's Caliban ends up making peace with his master Prospero, remaining complicit in the oppressed oppressor relationship, although Caliban achieves some kind of freedom towards the end of the play, The Tempest, by Shakespeare. Hence, Caesar creates a revolutionary Caliban. So here is the exchange between Prospero and Caliban from Amos Caesar's play, A Tempest. So Prospero says, come here, Caliban. Have you got anything to say in your own defense? Take advantage of my good humor. I am in a forgiving mood today, Caliban. Caliban responds, I'm not interested in defending myself. My only regret is that I have failed. Prospero says, what are you hoping for? Caliban answers, to get back my island and regain my freedom. Prospero, and what would you do all alone here on this island, Caliban, haunted by the devil, tempest-tossed? Caliban answers, first of all, I would get rid of you. I would spit you out, all your tricks and pomps, your white magic. Prospero, that's fairly a negative program, Caliban. <laughs> negative program. Caliban, you don't understand it. I say I'm going to spit you out, and that's very positive. Prospero answers, well, the world is really upside down. 
We have seen everything now. Caliban, as a dialectician. However, in spite of everything, I'm fond of you, Caliban. Come, let's make peace. We have lived together for 10 years and worked side by side. 10 years count for something, Caliban, after all. We have ended up by becoming compatriots. Caliban finally answered, you know very well that I'm not interested in your peace. I'm interested in being free. Free, you hear? So Caliban, Caesar's Caliban, is not interested in so-called peace, within quotation mark, that remains trapped within the disciplinary horizon of Prospero, because Prospero decides there what is peaceful and what is not. Prospero decides what is racist and what is not. You know, it's white supremacy works that way. White folks decide for us, people of color, what is racist and what is not. They will say what is diversity and what is not. They will decide what angry, what it means to be angry and what is not, and so on and so forth. So there's this question of white supremacy at work there. And Caliban is resisting this. But Caliban is interested in nothing short of freedom, as is obvious from the exchange. And sarcastically, mark this, Prospero calls Caliban a dialectician. But Caliban, given Caesar's own characterization, is indeed a dialectician, one who mobilizes his own, within quotation marks, dirty dialectics, and thus he celebrates the daily, the dull, the dirty, the crude, and the vulgar, within quotation marks all, while making his points about nothing but his and his land's freedom and liberation. Further, Caliban is a dialectician in the sense that he can discern and articulate the actually existing material contradictions and antagonisms between the Calibans and the Prosperous of the world, that is class antagonisms under capitalism and racial antagonisms that attest to racism itself, revealing a class-race dialectic and even the historically determinate but systemic connections between such structures of production relations and power relations as capitalism, colonialism slash imperialism, and racism. But as a dialectician, Caesar Scaliman is not just interested in identifying and demystifying contradictions and antagonisms as such, but it's also interested in, rather hell-bent on, change itself. Change represented by the revolutionary negation of unequal production relations and unequal power relations between different sites and subjects and scenes leading to the positive affirmation of nothing but freedom. In fact, to use the African revolutionary Amilcar Cabral's Césaire and Fanon inflected phrase, the total liberation of the colonized and the oppressed. But, Povitra, how much time am I left with? 20 minutes? Okay, so I, let, me, let me conclude. Okay, all right, I will conclude and then we can take our issues later, you know, of course. But what does all this have to do with interdisciplinarity here, or emancipatory interdisciplinarity as I have called it? While morphing into the voice of the oppressed and the colonized, Caliban himself enables us to think that interdisciplinarity is not an end, but a means to an end. That it is even a name or even a trope for a series of activities such as interaction and integration and synthesizing. And this is where Nogogi's global ethics comes in. Yes, indeed, inter interaction, integration, and synthesizing. You bring together different discourses. However, a caveat needs to be registered here. By bringing all these things together, Let's not erase the actually existing unequal power relations that are there in the war. That is to say, by unequal power relations, I mean unequal class relations, unequal race relations, unequal gender relations, and so on and so forth. They need to be taken into account. Let not interdisciplinarity be an intellectual practice that erases all these you know, unequal power relations and production relations. You know. And dialectically involve here both cancellation and preservation, both negation and affirmation of hegum, to use the Hegelian word, of sorts. In other words, Caliban himself can be seen as a dialectically engaged interdisciplinarian in a profoundly political sense. That is to say, given the context of Caesar's play itself, while Caliban negates the disciplinary dictates and domains of Prospero, Caliban still uses Prospero's own language but then Caliban weaves 
and interweaves indigenous stories and songs and histories and even the discourses of Western democracy and nation state, as well as the discourses of the life sciences, including the discourses of indigenous medicine, such that Caliban ends up transforming prosperous language on the one hand and the very nature of political discourse on the other, the kind of discourse that resists commodification, institutionalization, and even quick summarization. The musician, Anida Franco, once said, every tool is a weapon, provided you know how to hold it right. With Cesare Scaliban, one might say, interdisciplinarity itself is a weapon, provided you know how to hold it right. And this is a weapon in Caliban's struggle for self-liberation and for even the total emancipation of humanity. I'll stop here. Time, time is fairly a factor. The Oxford, it's actually called the Oxford Handbook of Interdisciplinarity. Which strikes me as an impossible object. <laughs> It's called also handbook. And speaking of the impossible, actually Caliban demands the impossible. When I think of the impossible, I also think of James Baldwin. When James Baldwin once put it this way, the least that we can demand is the impossible. And also I think of Che Guevara. Che Guevara once put it this way, and I had the opportunity, by the way, I just can't resist telling you that I was in Cuba, you know, in January this year. I was in Cuba and interacted with Cuban artists and poets and also black Cuban socialists there, and it was a great experience. But anyways, to quote Che Guevara, we are realists because we dream the impossible. So the question of the impossible is, is, is a very significant political question in certain sites in the third world. Yes? So doesn't that make the interpretation of what the handbook states is uh, an interpretation by the person who reads it? Sure, I mean, they, I mean, you're talking about the participation of readers there, but I think I haven't answered your question fully, and I, I will try to respond to two observations here, Sandy. Uh, this handbook, I have problems with that handbook, because that handbook, you know, invokes the global, but that Oxford handbook hasn't really included in it any uh, piece on interdisciplinarity by scholars, theorists, and activists from Asia, African, Latin. They invoke the global. They have a global approach to, mm -hmm. you know, into practices, theories and practices of interdisciplinarity, but leaving out the majority of the world. The majority, to speak of the majority of the world, is to speak of Asia, Africa, and Latin America, obviously. I mean, Europe and the US and Europe constitute only a tiny fraction of the entire world. So that is one. And second, the global, the invocation of the global has become empty. Many people keep paying lip service to the global. You know, we say, hey, we are going to be globally engaged. What does that mean, actually? There is a serious engagement with that, even in that, you know, otherwise, you know, deemed authoritative collection of essays on theories and practices of interdisciplinarity. So I'm taking issue with that particular work. I'm, I'm, uh, of course, and that's why I bring in a constellation of third world theorists and writers to talk about interdisciplinarity in a much more political and much more, uh, I would say, even an emancipatory way. I mean, everybody wants to be interdisciplinary, as you know, 
like every journal this just claims to be interdisciplinary. It has become a buzzword. But we have also noticed that interdisciplinarity has been pressed into the service of the dominant, the hegemony. Interdisciplinarity has been institutionalized. Even uh, transnational corporations also want to hire and have been hiring folks who have background in interdisciplinary studies and so on and so forth. It's a buzzword, a question that I'm raising in my work. So what? And in fact, I'm advancing a critique of this kind of commodified and is, inter, uh, institutionalized, commodified, commercialized you know, interdisciplinarity and positing an alternative model of it doing interdisciplinary works you know, by way of drawing on a whole host of you know, theorists and activists, even revolutionaries, from what is called the third world. So my project is a kind of response to that Oxford handbook of interdisciplinary among other things, of course. Um, so as far as we really want is to connect it back maybe with, uh, with our students, you know, it, it, to me it was really interesting also, you know, how you, you take Shakespeare, okay, so I take a character, but, uh, you know, when, when we are thinking about the word global, which is uh, used really loosely, but uh, also, uh, used really often, right? But you know uh, how exactly, uh, what exactly global means in in terms of literature, sure. of how you can read different texts, right? So for me, that's really important uh, for the students because oftentimes when they take different courses, you know, unless we we learn to make those connections right. or those intersections, then uh, we might imagine. What I learned in this class, okay, Shakespeare is, I can only write about Shakespeare in so many ways, but uh, I really like that you, uh, you know, showed them how you can make those connections, uh, you know, and take what you learn from um, different texts, but use different kinds of theories, but also what it means to Thank you. To write this really global, uh, to at least have a global perspective when you take on some kind of interpretation. Thank you. I think that's a great question and a challenging one. And I'm interested in, in taking this global approach too. But my take vis-a-vis -vis the global is admittedly a, a political one, a, an ideological one. First of all, I don't think that the global only means that you put here Bangladesh and Sri Lanka and Kenya and then Bolivia and Venezuela and take things a tiny bit from there, a tiny bit from there, and, and, and then make a chutney and uh, you know, some kind of chutneyfication to use uh, uh, Salman Rushdie's you know, words. Because this kind of chutneyfication may end up erasing, a point that I already made, actually existing power relations that are there in the world. So it's not a chartification, it's not a kind of just a random mix of things, you know, drawn from different parts of the world. So what do we do? How do we have a global uh, approach then to our literary study? I will put it this way. We have to take into account the decisively historically produced global phenomena in the first place. What are they? Capitalism, imperialism slash colonialism, racism and patriarchy, these macro structures, global structures of unequal power relations and unequal production relations. We have to take these structures into account and see how they affect the practice of everyday life. Then you are taking a global effort. There is no doubt, as far as I'm concerned, that capitalism has already been a decisively globalizing, globalized phenomenon. So to talk about the global is certainly to talk about political economy of capitalism. Of course, across the world. So you bring literary texts into some kind of conversation with that very structure and see, examine how that structure affects the literary text or the cultural form itself. So I, for one, think that if we take a global approach, we cannot bypass the question of global political economy. And there you become also interdisciplinary. So you bring in the global political economy by bringing in capitalism. And related to it is imperialism, global phenomena. We live in the era of US imperialism. US is global. So we need to talk about how the US has uh, been playing historically is a globalizing role in terms of its being an imperial power throughout the world. We have more than 900 plus military bases around the world. Not a single country has a single military base in our country here in the US. So what's going on? All right. So imperialism and colonialism and patriarchy, how that has been a global phenomenon. So I think literary texts that bypass or 
study of literary text that bypasses the structures fails to be global, fails to be globally engaged, because you're basically bypassing all this decisively globalizing structures and phenomena and so on and so forth. I'll put it this way. I for one also think, just one minute, I think we cannot make sense of who we are and what we do and what the implications of what we do without paying attention to these very big structures I have named, these big structures that continue to affect the practice of everyday life. I'll stop here. Mm -hmm. Yes? Uh, so uh, would you consider, because we, we had a reading for Aunt Vivek this week, and um, she was discussing the importance of putting um, colonial literature, if you're going to teach English literature and British literature specifically, and specifically in India, putting it beside local sort of indigenous literature. Is that one approach to... Yeah, sure, of course. I mean, I like that. I mean, I, I myself do that quite a bit. Thank you for saying that. I mean, it is important that we do cross readings and side by side. Again, then you have to take into account colonialism. You know, so like you read, for instance, Edward Said reads Jane Austen, remarkably, exemplary, in a global way, where in his book called Culture and Imperialism. He's famous for his reading of Jane Austen, but how does he read it globally? globally? How does he do that? He, in fact, brings Jane Austen into conversation with the Caribbean writers. In fact, he has reasons to. Why? Because in Jane Austen's words, Caribbean plantation continues to be a setting, background, and so on and so forth. And some of the characters, like, you know, the rich ones there, live on those on the slave labor and so on and so forth. So you have to then, you can, what you can do is you can bring Jane Austen's works into conversation with some Caribbean writers. Just to give one quick example here from none other than Edward Said himself. And Spivak does that. Spivak has done it, for instance, in terms of reading side by side Kim, Rudyard Kipling's work, and Rowinda Tagore. So she has done that. She has been doing this for quite some time. She is a famous you know, cross reader of literary texts uh, in a global way that way, although I do not agree with Spivak all the way, they have other problems and so on and so forth, but, you know, but, yeah, that's, that's the way, of course, uh, you do this, you know, putting texts into conversation. This is precisely the point that Nobubiya Thiongro has also emphatically made in his work, Global Ethics, from which I cite, cited earlier. Global Ethics is a great text. I mean, how do you really read, you know, literature, literary texts globally? put them into conversation. For instance, he reads, Nagubiya Thiongo reads Nostromo by Joseph Conrad, side by side with Lenin and Franz Fanon. He, in fact, when I had a conversation with Nagogi, by the way, Nagogi came to WSU in 2005. And I, in fact, in front of Nagogi, I provided a critical overview of his entire work very quickly, <laughs> taking up this category of land, labor, language, and the body. And he was very pleased. I just couldn't resist the temptation of sharing that with you. The thing is that this is now available online, on YouTube. You put my name, Asparusen, and Nogubi Yathiyongo, this thing will show up. And then Nogubi also talks about, you know, how you read literature globally. And before Nogubi, I also talk about how we can uh, read literary texts globally. So there is one reference, you know, that is available online. So Nogubi does that, you know, uh, bringing texts into con uh, conversation. But there is one danger here. There, I mean, you bring this text into conversation, but let's not forget that there have been always, already, you know, unequal power relations and production relations that characterize the very politics of knowledge production. I should also point out here, I had an anecdote, I had a, uh, you know, a conversation with someone, an American friend, a very well-read person. So I told him this, so I know William Carlos Williams. I know Wallace Stevens, yes, to the, I've tried to know them. Know something at least about them. But do you know who Kazi knows rule Islam? And there was silence. And that silence is symptomatic. And that silence, I won't say that I would just simply blame him, but that silence is suggestive, to say the least. That silence, in fact, tells us that there has already been this unequal exchange between different sites and subjects and scenes. Yeah. So we have to give those things, or take those things into account while reading literary texts or cultural forms. Carol. So kind to me in your beginning, and so now I want to give you an opportunity to correct me if I'm wrong. Yes. But uh, I tend to feel I, I see how all of these interpenetrate, but to me the one we have to interrogate the most is language, because if we 
are progressive, we already understand the problems with land, labor, and the body fairly well, not perfectly, but we are used to interrogating those. But language, we have so many figures of speech, like I'm thinking about how we often say when we're talking about diversity, all the voices have to be heard. But that is only the very, very initial beginning, because as you're pointing out, the way they're all heard in the language of the oppressor. That's how they're heard. And that language inflects everything about the way we understand. So that now we've reached this era of old facts because our insistence that language use is subjective has led people to believe that that means that everybody has their own truths and all the truths are of equal weight. So, you know, if I say this is a thermos and you say, no, it isn't, it's a motorcycle, we're both, uh, we're both equally right because our voices are heard. So now there's diversity. Well, no, you know, that's just the beginning. We have to constantly interrogate what do we mean by these terms? What does the language tell us? What are the built-in biases of the language? So for me, if I were drawing those circles, I guess I would want to have language sort of either enclosing the others, although of course Foucault would say the body is the one way to get out of that, or interpenetrating them so that that's the lens, language is always the lens through which we see everything else. Would, so would you disagree with that? No, I don't actually, and uh, you have raised a very uh, significant, and, and I would say politically significant question here. And I want to say just a few things quickly about the question of language, but before that, let me say this. This is a tentative model, and there isn't any hierarchical order maintained here. However, I put land because I took uh, the question of land itself becomes the language of struggle. So there is that thing. You mark my statement here. Land itself becomes the language of the struggle. So what we really mean by language, that's a very uh, fundamental question. And uh, as far as, uh, you know, land is concerned, you know, Leslie Marmon Silko, in fact, captures the slogan of Native Americans in her, you know, novel called Almanac of the Dead. And she puts it there, land first, talk later. So she is, she is that Leslie Marmon, I'm quoting Leslie Marmon Silko. So land first, talk later. But she has to say that in language too, that land first, talk later. So language is fundamental, I would say. And Franz Fano himself, we have read Franz Fano, in his black skin, white mask. The first chapter is devoted to language. The chapter is called, if you recall, the Negro and the language, Negro and his language. And the first line, let me quote uh, Franz Fano, quote, I ascribe a fundamental importance to language, unquote. So language does play a very crucial role. But there is also this tendency that, uh, you know, fetishizing language, like it's all discourse, it's all text, to the point that truths themselves, in the name of uh, truth being plural, you know, that you don't have to take any responsibility, anything goes. If you say 22 workers died yesterday because uh, the mill owners killed them, shot them, you say, well, 22 died, it's your interpretation. It's not true, and so on and so forth. So we have to be also careful about how we really deploy language and have to be careful how best we can use language in the interest. We have to have some goals here, not teleological, have some goals in the interest of emancipation. So language too is a fundamental political <coughs> weapon, weapon in our struggle, and it has been for Caliban, for third world people, so, and so on and so forth. But again, language itself brings out this question of land, labor, and the body. Of course, the body itself is the site and the source of the production of language. The body gets implicated in the language in all sorts of ways. As I already pointed out, land is the language, can be language of struggle. And Marx pointed out, labor is the language of everyday struggle for the workers. So, you know, so language is there. In a, it makes sense when it, it encloses, it does. I will stop here, it's actually time. <laughs> <laughs> well, just a minute. I know Amanda may have had, do you have a comment or a question? It's a question. Um, oh, how much time? You can ask him the question, yeah. and after that, he'll walk with you and answer it. Okay. Um, I am really interested in the fact that uh, in observing Caliban's character, you kind of took from Spivak, you looked at also the literal and also the figurative of right. the character. Right. Right. What made you first want to explore Caliban? What made me? Oh, to put me, I was, you know something? I had this colonial education in Bangladesh, and given my background, I have to read Shakespeare quite a bit. 
and uh, when I read Shakespeare, I before I read uh, you know this post-colonial readings or texts on Caliban, I was attracted to, to that particular character because of the ways in which he rebelled, and I could see that very well. And I come from a former colony, which in fact went uh, underwent double decolonization, uh, but still not free. So Caliban resonated with me right from the get-go, you know, as a character, figurative. So yeah, I would put it that way. We're both uh, from very colonized and uh, very colonial subjects who had to decolonize ourselves, and we're still decolonizing ourselves. Yeah, it is an thank unfinished you. project. Yes, thank you so much, Asfar. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bring it, bring it, thank you. Thank you.